Greetings, everyone. I am given the honor to prepare you with my comforting voice for the second part. I am Gökhan Kodalak. I am. Uh, I have. I am one of the founding partners of About Blank. This is our office from Istanbul. We are a young and emerging office, and we have. We are trying to combine different scales, such as the macro scale with urban design, the meso scale that I will put it, the architectural practice, and at the same time the micro scale with projects like theater sets, and I, I can talk about this uh, later in my uh, presentation, uh, urban, urban interventions, and at the same time workshops and theoretical uh, explorations and so on. So, our office is trying to uh, combine, in, in addition to uh, some, a, a form of macro, macro scholar approach, uh, a sort of uh, bridge between the international collaborations and at the same time uh, national projects. We have in the past collaborated with firms from British, American and Dutch contexts, especially uh, I can give the example of uh, our collaboration in 2000. 12 with MBRDV, the Dutch firm, and today I will talk about, out of all these projects, uh, a, sp a specific one that is called Open Source or Open Architecture uh, project that we did for the Antalya Architecture Biennial. So, as a gateway to our project, I want to talk about the Gezi event because uh, our project started at the end of the summer of two 2013, and it was just after uh, the, we had the Gezi event and we participated in it, of course, because it was also very close to our office. We were, our offices in Nishantashi and everything uh, that happened in the Gezi Park was part of our milieu, so to speak. And uh, the Gezi Park, well, it is hard to uh, summarize it in uh, maybe one paragraph, but to give, to give you a very rough summary, the way we understand it in the Gezi Park was that it was a sort of imagining nimbius, so to speak, rather than reducing it to some form of uh, resistance to the parliamentary, you know, uh, governmental uh, agencies that are in power in Turkey and so on and so forth. And by uh, imagining nimbius, what I mean is that imagining nimbius in terms of ecological milieus, in terms of the understanding of the natural environment within the urban framework rather than going back to some form of nostalgic golden mother earth. Uh, imagining new milieus in the sense of political new milieus, again in the sense of not uh, creating a new alternative within the parliamentary system, but creating some alternative, a more self-constitutive bottom-up approach about politics and creating new milieus in terms of social, uh, say, uh, environments and new forms of uh, entertainment and at the same time really most relevant to our uh, presentation, imagining new views in terms of the spatial and architectural environment, the built environment. And when I'm talking about imagining, of course, I'm at the same time talking about embodying. It is not solely a conceptual or mental process, but it is at the same time how people did and practiced these things uh, at these milieus. And, well, it was also very personal, of course, for me because I arrived from New York where I'm doing my uh, PhD in uh, Cornell University in the middle of things and these are taken from my uh, cell phone photographs, these dirty photographs and you can see here that it, uh, we are thrown a gas canister from the police and one of the protesters is taking it back and throwing it back to the police. So it is in this sense a very physically violent encounter but I also want to talk about another dimension to this violence, which is it also at the same time, one can say, uh, deconstructed some of the cliches about the relationship with public space and uh, its connection with the private space. And what I mean by this is that we usually make uh, our discussions around this dichotomy. That is to say, on the one hand, you have the public space, which we suppose that are the public, the people are represented and can, they can express themselves freely. And on the other hand, we have the private space, which, as you all know, is you know, owned by certain private individuals or collectives and so on. But what I want to say is about this uh, dichotomy is that this is uh, some sort of a trap 
that usually uh, engages us and makes our discussions and at the same time our embodiments very frigid, so to speak, rather than pregnant. So, what one of the, we were already, of course, experimenting on this before Gezira, but what made it really uh, clear and visible was that we need to have another dimension, another way of speaking about things, which is, uh, what, how I term it, the common space, which comes from the English commons and so on and so forth. It has its position in Spinoza's political philosophy and lately the contemporary environment, Negri and Michael Hart, for those of you who are interested in contemporary political theory, uh, updated this notion, which means, again, to give you a very rough summary, underneath the public and the private space, you have this cultural natural continuum, which can be deemed the common space. So the first operation what you need to do is to deconstruct, so to speak, the public and the private, so as to recognize or unearth the common, the commonality or the common space that is the earth itself. But of course, if we only think about this in these terms, it will be very problematic because it is not something that's some kind of a hidden treasure underneath, whenever you deconstruct everything will be okay, but rather it is only the first operation. So this is the introduction to the common space, but when, when you do this operation, what you see is the potentiality, so to speak, or the virtuality of the common space. So then you need to actualize it, no? So then you need to construct it. This is the second operation. You need to be there. You need to self-constitute all the organizations and new, uh, say, architectural and spatial components and logistic components, which we can also talk about maybe in our discussion about the Gezi event, all the tents, all the new medical facilities that were already you know, constructed in situ, there spontaneously, and so on and so forth. And then, uh, to you know, close it very shortly, and then you also need, of course, the third dimension, which is to sustain it, which is to persevere, which is to try to you know, protect it and try to enrich it, which is, I can say, the hardest part. So, from this I can make the transition to a project because when you think about this, the role of the architect, in, uh, certainly in the contemporary conventional, say, uh, processes of the built environment, is that you always become this intermediary figure between the clients, which are the state apparatuses on the one hand, or the private uh, capitalist apparatuses on the other hand, and the users, and of course, the problematic part is that the users usually get to know and get to recognize what is going on after you deal with, uh, after you have your decision-making process with the client and the architect. So the users are always subordinated, subaltern. In this process, they always arrive later, and what they see, what they confront, is predetermined, prefixed functions, forms, experiences, and so on and so forth. They, so they need to manipulate at their best within these cages, so to speak which would be the point of you know, the Marxist uh, political theorist, the urban theorist, Henry Lefebvre. So when Antalya Biennial in 2013 approached us and asked us to do a pres uh, an e exhibition in one of the spaces they already predetermined for us, of course our first uh, approach, our first reply was to say, to tell them that we will do something in the urban environment, in the urban matrix, not in one of those domesticated places. And what we will do was to try to come up with a new experiment what in, in, in which we de deem it the open architecture or open source architecture, which is trying to formulate a different logic to the relationship of power between the users and the clients and the, so to speak, architects. So, now I will give you a very short summary about our project. The project is very basic. We had at the same time, of course, very low budget. There are uh, small cubes, your everyday cubes, which have two of their sides open, and you have four, uh, you have four wheels underneath them, and they are just left one day at, in, in, a, in a casual morning in uh, two sides of the Antalya. One of them is the Karaliol Park, which is close to this beautiful sea, and the other one will be about uh, in the heritage side of the Hadrian Skate. So the structure is pretty basic, and we are trying to, of course, uh, make it in length, width, and I think height is 2.5 meters, something like that, which is to say, it is trying to uh, be at the same time 
carryable and pushable and pullable by one individual, but at the same time compact enough to include more than you know a, a small group. One can say three to five people. So, okay, what is this? So the idea of this, and this is the Hadrian skate, where you have the, a very different environment, and here you have the uh, public area, the park, and its relationship with the urban square. So. I will talk through three trajectories and I will start with the open function. So the first idea is to come up with this notion which is problematic in both senses, both in the, I can say, uh, conventional architecture, but at the same time, I can even say in participatory architecture that you have come to a consensus or you decide yourself from a top-down notion what the function will be and then you fix it. No? So this is a conference center and then you have your houses, you have your offices. What we thought, what, what, the, the first question we had was, what if you have no function? Which is not to say that you are indecisive as an architect, you don't know, but it is about giving what the function will be over to the users. No? So that they can define what they want to do, how, how to channel their desires and needs through these empty spaces. So Cedric Price, the English architect, would call this calculated indeterminacy, so to speak. So you are indetermined, but indetermined in the sense that to instigate a different differential notion of, uh, say, uh, new functions and new abilities by the users themselves. So then we, of course, came up with a taxonomy of functions in our minds, but as this, these will not be shown to the users, they will just encounter the objects and try to make sense of them. It was only for us to imagine what can be in this in these uh, cubes, can they be, you know, game cubes, movie cubes, exhibition cubes, science cubes, anything you want, the office cubes, workshop cubes, cafe cubes, and at, at, at the same time, of course, certain forms of affect, can they be cubes of sorrow, cubes of dreaming, and cubes of love. But, well, the beautiful part, of course, is that we never know. We would never know, and that's the sur surpriseful and interesting part for us, what they will do, what they can do with these objects. So, what happened afterwards is, throughout this process, which is a 30-day uh, experiment, after the, afterwards they, they needed to be taken back, was that they were used in many different and very surprising uh, ways. Well, children, of course, immediately understood that this is a very playful uh, 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 playful environment in which they can do whatever they want and they try to project their own uh, playful uh, characters at the same time skate rollers which is also interesting maybe to combine it with the uh, morning uh, discussion about the place where they, it was built for the skateboarders and for the skate rollers themselves. But here you can see, and I think this is the most uh, subversive part of uh, how users can challenge and uh, dominate and uh, maybe employ their own functions, is that they, the, the, the space is not predetermined as a, as a place for them, but they already come and occupy it, so to speak. So they change it and they understand that they can use it and they even see them as their allies no? because they're mobile. So, and at the same time, of course, the whiteness is, uh, in, in terms of our mind, it was a neutral uh, condition, but we immediately saw that it afforded the people to use it as some kind of a drawing board and some kind of a board for graffiti and so on and so forth. And I can, of, of course, go on about this because one, and one of the most surprising, I can say, moments was that when we see that it was not solely used by people with marginal commercial activities for, you know, different uses for recreation, for street concerts and so on and so forth, but at the same time it was used by a dog for, for a week. It always at the night came back and used it. So it was also to show us the thresholds and the anthropocentric understanding of us and how we see the urban actors, because all the way we were only talking, thinking about the humans, but at the same time the animals themselves, so to speak, are also today more than ever. Uh, one of the urban actors. So the second one is the open connection. And by open connection, I mean some form of a new understanding of connecting the architecture itself with its environment through mobility. Because again, this is the maybe the second part of 
trying to challenge the Vitruvian triad in which we understand architecture that's something always stable and static. It always has its roots and it, it has its location and it has its place, so to speak. But what we, what, when you have this very basic you know, experiment, you have the uh, architecture that is on the move, that is mobile. Of course, you have different experiences and interactions. Immediately you understand that whenever the social dynamics change in an urban environment, the cubes can be pushed and pulled according to these different dimensions, which means when, for example, when we see that one of these uh, concerts, the, the person who wanted to play and you know, try to attract uh, the, the visitors and audience to himself, what we saw was that he immediately pulled the cube, one of the open cubes, to the center of the uh, urban environment. So, because he wanted to be the center of, the, of attention, so to speak. But when at night we saw another couple that wanted to have an intimate conversation and other things, what they did was, uh, in a different sense, to push the, the cubes to the side of the, you know, under the, the trees and so on and so forth, to a darker side, so that they could have that different uh, understanding and interaction with their environment. So. It, of course, immediately changes your relationship with your environment because it is not only you who is changing and location, but at the same time, it is the architecture itself that moves and changes, so it gives you a very dynamic understanding of your environment, which also, I can say, gives you a new definition of context. You know? Because with context, what we have is, we usually understand that we have this static built environment, and then we have this new object that comes within it, and then we have this weird relationship, whether the object will you know, subdue and you know, bow before the uh, constraints of the, and the characteristics of the urban environment, or will alienate it, and so on and so forth, this very weird dichotomy. With, with, with this mobility, what you have, on the other hand, is that context is, we understand and recognize that context is a very dynamic you know, relationship. Context is not solely about static relationship com comparisons between forms, but it is at the same time, and maybe more importantly, about the relationship of speeds and slownesses, and at the same time, I can say, different proportions of you know, relationships, and at the same time, uh, magnitudes of intensities. So, and the last one, and I will conclude with this, is what I call the open interaction. And here, of course, we come back to a uh, full circle to our discussion about power. So here, what with this experiment, what what we achieved, or what we at least pursued to achieve, was a certain form of potentiation. So when I use the term potentiate. Uh, I'm using it very consciously and uh, in comparison to empower, which is again a very, I think, problematic verb that is used in municipal and participatory projects because, and this is very hard to do in English, but in Latin you have two different words for power. No, you have potestas and you have potentia. And I think in French you have the correspondence, the puissance and pouvoir. No? So, and when you think about empowering, what empowering implies is that you yourself have the power. The users do not have it, so to speak. A power is some kind of a possession like wealth. And in a philanthropic gesture, what you do is to give some of your power to the users. And, well, to give a weird example, it, it's just like Angela Jolie going to the, you know, and helping African kids, so to speak. So it's a very suspicious move, I would say, this empowerment. But whereas, and it is this potentious, this top-down approach, you know, with, with potentiation or with the, with the verb when you use or with the approach, of course, this is not solely a linguistic uh, differentiation. When you think about potentiation, and you are not potentiating the users, but what you do is to potentiate the environment, which is very different. Your object also changes. So potentiate means you create more potential and possibilities for special experiences. You try to maximize them. You try to expand uh, the potentials uh, so that the users themselves who already have different forms, different magnitudes, different degrees of power can actualize what they want, what they desire, what they need in certain, of course, constraints. It is not free for all, but still 
it is you who lead the decision for the users themselves rather than coming up with a you know, consensus or some romantic approach to a representative and social contract. So, I had a movie but I cannot play it in this computer, but I can say that this is the overall, uh, uh, overall message of our experiment and it was and it was an experiment about, as I, as I said, about potentiation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.